So uh, the first thing is, um, you know, as we go through the college counseling process with you and with your children, we're going to be 100% focused on what's the right fit for them. How do we get them to the right place? What's the right fit for your family in terms of finances and in terms of expectations? Uh, we are not charged by anybody to make sure that there are a certain number of uh, prestigious schools on the list. We do not have our ego involved in this. This is 100% focused on your kids and what's right for them. Uh, so know that that's the principle that we're operating from at all times. And we're glad to be in a place where that is capable of being done because it's not always true at other schools. Okay. Secondly, we're really focused on a student-led process. We really want to empower students to lead their own process. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, that's how they get to the place that's right for them. Not what we think or what you think or what their friends think or relatives think, but they, what they will come to discover is the right place for them. That's important. But number two is that applying to college, as you know, is sort of a capstone project to the high school experience. Um, it's a litmus test, in a way, of being ready to go to college. And so going through the process with them, leading it with our support, of course, uh, is what allows them to develop uh, the strategies, the habits, and uh, the skills that they need to succeed in college when we're not there with them. So being able to make a plan, set deadlines, meet deadlines, call somebody that they don't know, write an email uh, effectively, those are all things that they'll need to be able to do. And then the third reason is that we all know you get to college, you have a rough day, freshman year, and you start questioning, right? Am I in the right place? Can I do this? And if they are the ones who got themselves there, they will have the self-confidence to say, nope, I'm just having a bad day, just had a bad test, whatever it is, I got myself here, I can get myself through this, and I can succeed. So we're, you know, we're all gonna be there supporting them, but we're gonna make sure that they're taking the lead, and they can do it, because they want to go to college, and they want to uh, get to that place. Okay, thanks. Uh, number three, we are really lucky to be in a place that has two college counselors for about 60 students. Uh, that's about how many I had myself at my previous place. So we're able to be very personal. Um, even being new, we have gotten to know the seniors very well, very quickly. Um, we're able to spend as much time as they need. Um, we've both been spending lots of time reading essays, and I, you know, I'm not Previously, I was always like, all right, let's get this done so I can get to the next person. We are gifted that uh, awesome amount of time of whatever it takes. Um, so we can sit with them as long as they need. They can come in as often as they need. We will get to know them well. We'll get to know the family situation well. That's a real blessing. So we're really happy about that. Uh, and the other thing, too, is, as you'll find as we go through the process, is we are going to have programming that handles kind of the basic nuts and bolts. Some of that will be done in small groups or larger groups, but most of the counseling is gonna be done individually in our offices because every student uh, is going through a different process at a different time, and that's the most effective way for things to get done, which I think leads to the next one. Maybe. Uh, yeah, there we go. go straight to there we go. There we go. Um, is that uh, at Fountain Valley, this is a place where kids are going all over the place, right? And we are going to honor and celebrate all kinds of searches. And that's kind of the thing that Steve and I are both coming from. That, that's what our schools were like as well, is whatever is right for the student, that could be a, an Ivy League school, that could be the local public university with as much scholarship as possible, it could be a liberal arts college, right here in town or across the country. It could be a service academy. It could be schools in other countries. Whatever it is that's right for them, that's what we want to celebrate. Um, and so that individual uh, counseling is what allows that to happen. We also know that there are lots of families where the financial part is going to be a big part of the process. We're familiar with that, too. That's what we're used to. And so counseling about a list is going to be not only about getting in, but also about we agree with you that it is important uh, for you to be able to uh, pay your mortgage and retire and eat and some of those other things that you might like to do in addition to paying for college. So know that that's something that we focus on. Okay. Um, our goal 
is to, uh, as it says up there, model a calm and low stress and collaborative approach. That's pretty easy to do here. Like that is the ethos of the place. And we are very thankful for that. And we want to continue to cultivate that. Um, we feel like if we are acting in that way and having perspective about the process, uh, that helps to, to heal us the same way too. Um, so thank you for supporting that. Which gets to the last part. Um, is that we should all get along. Um, there's really, you know, you read these horror stories at, at other schools and newspapers, whatever, about uh, counselors and students and parents all at each other's throats and lawsuits and all that, you know, just crazy stuff. That's not the, the way it's going to be here, um, of course. And, um, you know, we're all on the same team. Uh, we can communicate with each other. I feel like this should be a very uh, collaborative process. Uh, I did start out at the beginning of my career um, teaching and coaching, and uh, one of the things I did for a long time was seventh grade baseball. And I had a lot more angry phone calls about seventh grade baseball <laughs> than about college counseling. Which maybe speaks to priorities, maybe it speaks to uh, me learning how to avoid conflict. Um, but I think mostly what it speaks to is that there's really no reason for me. I don't ever say no. Um, so I'm going to mention a couple of other things. Uh, I think one thing that's always uh, comes up is timeline, right? And we handed out uh, a timeline. You may have had a chance to look at it and answer any questions about it. But I'm just going to mention a couple of things. Um, one is that uh, we do feel like starting junior year is the appropriate time. Um, we will, we've already had one class meeting with juniors. We've had, we will have one with ninth and 10th graders, and that's certainly appropriate. But we believe very strongly in not having the college counseling process take over the whole high school experience. Um, we want to preserve the value of the high school experience. Uh, at no point did anyone ever make a uh, sort of logical decision to say applying to college should be a four-year process, right? That doesn't make any sense at all. It's not healthy for students. So we do think we're, kind of, we're starting at the right time. Um, what we will do is sometime, we're not sure yet, depends how quickly we uh, sort of get the seniors settled and we don't, we haven't done it yet here, so we don't know. But probably we'll be able to kind of start things in December. Um, and what we will do in terms of dividing up the class is we will send out a survey uh, to students and kind of get a sense of what their interests are, what they foresee their process being like. And there may be reasons to work with uh, one of us rather than the other. For example, if uh, someone's interested in playing soccer in college, Stephen has a son who's doing that. He has a lot of experience with that, so it makes sense. Um, maybe somebody from my advisory group, obviously that makes sense for me to do that. Uh, so there's, you know, if someone really likes fishing, that would be someone that I could work with. So there's lots of reasons that could go into that. And then we'll also just try to split up the class logically in terms of demographics, so we each have boarding students and day students. Um, and, you know, we'll just kind of figure out what makes sense. But we will do it, um, I think, especially in a school as small as this, like trying to do requests and things like that really doesn't work out. And in the end, I mean, it's going to be the same working with either of us. Um, so that's that. Um, things that we will then do pretty quickly is get started with uh, some small group seminars to provide some nuts and bolts about the process for students, to get them thinking about things, hopefully in a um, little bit more nuanced way than maybe they have been. And then very quickly we will have a sort of first individual meeting with their counselor. And that's where we will spend some time getting to know each other. And from that meeting, probably there will come at least an initial list of schools based on um, what the student says he or she is interested in. And then you know, from there, then it becomes a little bit more individualized. But that's sort of the, the starting point. plenty of time to get started and to uh, you know, do visits and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in fact, you know, I think one of the other risks of starting too early is that students just aren't really ready to do that. They're not thinking about things in that sophisticated way for the most part. Um, and in addition, you also, I think, run the risk of a sort of foreclosure, right? Vanderbilt is my favorite school, right? I picked it when I was, you know, 14 years old. Well, not 
does that really help you in your studies here at OU, right? What were you really thinking about? And that, we, I think, leaving that time open uh, for things to bubble up and for changes to happen before that foreclosure is a really good idea. So that's why starting too early has, I think, some risks. Um, so what we want to focus on now then, and what we focused on with the juniors earlier this year, is what should they be doing now, right, in terms of preparing to apply to college, more than necessarily applying to college. And so that's where what Stephen's going to talk about. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, if in the event that I you know, throw out terminology that you're unfamiliar with, we can also cover it during the Q&A. But um, my section really is going to talk about what students are in control of, which is over 90% of their college application process. It's sort of broken down into academics, uh, working with teachers, uh, activities, and visits. So I want to first focus on the academic portion. Students can control their academic investment and performance. Uh, Jeff mentioned earlier the size of Fountain Valley. Uh, the student-faculty ratio allows students to get to know their teachers, uh, seek additional help um, and good advice, you know, whether it's working on a problem set or an essay or any, anything in between. But right now, obviously, during the junior year, it's a good time, as it always has been, to do well in your courses. Um, you know, obviously, that, that sounds obvious, I know. Um, Students, juniors, sometimes get too far ahead of themselves. Uh, Jeff said that self-advocacy <laughs> and resilience is a big part of why parents and students select independent schools. Um, they're able to work through those rough patches, that little bit of turbulence. So um, in terms of academic investment, this is a good time to do that. Uh, go ahead and seek as, as much additional help um, as possible. Looking forward or planning backwards, um, if, you're, if, you're, if your child or you're not sure of where they need to be uh, by graduation, uh, the school profile and our graduation requirements typically are a baseline of the courses that need to be satisfied prior to earning a Fountain Valley School Diploma. We know that. Um, after that, it's what I term as being appropriate, appropriately subscribed in your courses. Um, that doesn't always mean loading up with what we perceive or what your child perceives as the most advanced courses. It's what's appropriate, where they're interested in, uh, the courses they're interested in, and also the electives that maybe they've been putting off uh, for the first two years, three years at Fountain Valley. A nice, balanced curriculum is a healthy student. Um, colleges read transcripts very carefully, um, and they'll look at what has what they've completed, what's in progress, and their performance in the context of those courses. Um, Fountain Valley, again, can help provide you know, what I would term academic counseling. Let's see where you'd like to be uh, May 2025, and plan backwards and see where we can find those pockets of, of space, those open blocks to satisfy um, and complement interest and ability, but also uh, it's, it's about the Fountain Valley experience. It's a distinctive place. We have very distinctive electives um, that I think Jeff and I want, want our students to take full advantage of. Um, activities. What should they be doing? Um, there's sort of a lot of, I guess, mythology myths about what students should be doing in high school. Uh, they should be invested in what they enjoy and what, what brings them joy, what sustains them, and where they can have the biggest impact and leave a really positive legacy where they go. Um, for some students, that yes, that does involve community service. Any service to others, whether it's in the form of an alliance, a unity day, uh, sports, or other non-competitive, just collaborative opportunities on campus is a, is a service to our community and in the community at large. A lot of what your child should be doing, uh, we hope, should inform their college process. Um, it's not just academics, it's also how they can continue to pursue what they enjoy, um, but also developing skills where they can begin new hobbies or new interests. So as, as, as you go through this process as parents and as they go through this process as, as students, 
you know, think about what is complimentary, what's enriching. Baked in there is a little disappointment sometimes, a little, a, a little turbulence. So um, activities are uh, extremely important. Um, Jeff mentioned uh, the athletic recruiting piece, the student athletes. There is absolutely nothing better than representing your school in whatever form or fashion. Um, former Division Three athlete, uh, Division Three, Division Two, Division One are all competitive, well resourced, and wonderful ways to one stay in your lane, so to speak, and have an instant community. Um, Jeff and I are very well versed and have a lot of experience with working with all types of athletes. Um, so, if if I can if I can ask one favor, um, Division Three is is hyper competitive. Don't don't lose sight of that, as well as the, the academic component that also um, can complement the athletic piece. So um, we're happy to do that. Teachers. Um, it makes sense for any student to get to know their teacher, both within, you know, just as their uh, professional relationship, but also on a personal level. Teachers have a really good insight, and they're able to identify uh, areas of interest or skills that are starting to refine very quickly, um, or that potentially could be refined or explored. Um, this is a good opportunity for juniors in particular to get to know their teachers because they will be writing their letters of recommendation. Um, Jeff mentioned a few times about the, this, the class size here and our individual approach. That certainly impacts um, our letter of recommendation, our insight, and how we're able to, to share your child's narrative with, um, with the colleges of their choice. Um, that investment in academics, in activities, um, and in their, in, in their classroom and getting to know their teachers is all within your, their control. Um, some students seem, seem or appear, we perceive, are better at, that, better at doing that than others, but it's been my experience that um, our students here are easygoing, accessible, and they really are invested in, in learning more about themselves um, and just being better students. Uh, college visits, and you'll hear a lot about this. Um, there's no one perfect formula. I, I know as a, a parent with two in, in college, it was what worked best with our schedule, right? What was best for the, the family system, all things being considered. Sometimes that meant one parent was going on most of the visits and another wasn't. Um, sometimes it meant summer visits or fall, uh, midwinter or spring. Um, it's always good, again, to plan backwards. At least know when your family trips are or obligations and then try to carve out appropriate time and space to um, schedule visits. They're, they're very easy to visit um, and Jeff and I are, are happy to serve as a impromptu travel agent. We've been <laughs> to over 150, 170 colleges and universities during our time. And so we, we're familiar with uh, highways, interstates, restaurants, uh, you know, the nooks and crannies of, of a lot of the schools where your children will, will be considering. Um, On-campus visits are great. Virtual visits have also gained, obviously, a lot of, uh, a lot of steam since 2020. It's a wonderful opportunity to connect uh, individually with a college admission rep if they're assigned to the, uh, to the West or to Colorado or even the Springs. Um, that is always a nice uh, way for your child, it's initiated by your child, um, to get to know a little more about that college or university before they visit uh, for a full information session um, and a boots on the ground campus tour. Okay. All right. Yes. Um, one, we've been talking a lot about different timeline things, and one thing that I do want to uh, just reiterate is that there is no one timeline, right? If you notice, uh, all of those things on there have a range of things, range of times that they can be done. Um, other than making junior year grade right now is the only time to do that. Most of the other things can be done within an acceptable range, whether that's visits, testing, anything like that. Uh, in fact, earlier this week, there was a, a teacher, an advisor, a, a senior who came to me and was saying, I was really anxious, falling behind, you know, this, that, that, you know, and I was like, that's okay, right? It's not time to panic yet. Even as a senior, every 
everybody is not doing everything at the same time. And we do need, it's okay to give students some time, uh, some ability to determine when they do things, right? And we prefer it's not at the last minute, <coughs> and we'll try to work on that. But it still has to be a little bit on their own timeline. When Let's give them their own timeline when we can. I think that's, that's kind of that. Um, so I want to mention a couple things about testing. Obviously, there's lots in the news since the pandemic about most schools being test optional, um, and that looks like that is going to continue, except with a few exceptions. Um, and you know that is great for students who turn out not to be terrific standardized test takers. It's a good time to be alive. But the beginning of the process, in our opinion, hasn't really changed. Every student should at least try uh, and give a good try to standardized testing and see how they do, right? If they can, because the reason is, if they can turn in a good test score, and that depends on each college's definition, but if they can, that's going to be helpful, right? Colleges truly are test optional. We can ask, Chris just came in, we can ask him if that's really true, but colleges really are test optional. But it does mean that the process looks a little bit different. It's gonna be focused on the other parts of the application a little bit more may be great, but if a student can turn in a really good test score, that's going to be a plus, just like anything else that would be a plus in the application. So we want to give every student the opportunity to at least possibly get to that point. Okay. Um, so everybody recently took either the uh, pre-ACT or PSAT this week, so a little bit of practice. Um, we have sent out an email about test preparation, uh, and there are lots of options for that. Test preparation generally can be effective. Um, and so finding the right way to do that, there are several options on that email, and we're obviously happy to discuss with you or discuss with students what might be right for them. Generally, you know, if there is a general approach, you, know, you might start with a class um, and then move more to something more self-directed. Um, if the self-directing isn't working, then you have to have more directing. That's just kind of you know, the way that you go through it. Um, generally would suggest that every student take the SAT and the ACT at some point during junior year. Um, November through February is a great time because that gives us something to look at as we're talking during the spring, but if it's later in the spring, that's also fine. We can deal with that. Okay. Um, before I get to my uh, conclusion, you can click to that. I was going to say just one quick thing. Um, you know, we have noticed a little bit with the senior class that there's a few families that are using independent college counselors. Um, and that has become a pretty big business around the country. You probably heard about it, read about it, know people who use them, et cetera. And that's fine. We're not in any way threatened by that. But I did want to say a couple of things about it. Um, I think for international students, that's, that's been going on for a long time. And there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. I want to make sense communicating with family and so on. For day students, for domestic boarding students, um, what I would say is there are situations around the country where independent college counselors play a great role. Like I went to a big public high school, never talked to a college counselor, didn't know anything about any of it. Um, maybe that could have been helpful. Um, so there's those situations that are out there. And there are some good, very good independent college counselors. But my thought that I want to share with you, our thought is here at Fountain Valley, like there's really no reason. I do understand, like, in the last year, they only had one college counselor, and there was turnover. Like, I understand there's, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, anxiety about that. But we're here. There's two of us. Like, there's really no reason for it. And there's a couple reasons. Um, one is that we can do things by the virtue of our position that independent counselors can't do, right? Like, write the recommendation. So it's really important that students engage with us <coughs> as opposed to an outside person who's not writing. Number two, we know the context of the high school. We can see all the scattergrams and scores. They can't. So they're recommending colleges somewhat blindly because they don't really know the context of each individual high school that the student goes to. Number three, we know what the rest of the application looks like. We know what we're writing. We know what the teachers have written. Uh, we know what the transcript looks like. So we can give advice that's a lot more focused on all of the information that that other person is the other thing I would say too is we're good. <laughs> we are. Right? I'm hoping Chris is going to say that. Um, I mean, each of
of us has done, I don't know, 800 college searches over the year with all different types of students, right? Um, so we know what we're doing. And, you know, especially after having been here a year, we'll know a lot more about Fountain Valley for your kids than we do for this year, although we've caught up pretty quickly. Um, and one other thing that I would say is frequently when I've had students, you know, it's never a problem. I don't, it doesn't bother me. But I, it bothers me in the sense that it doesn't usually work out well. It's usually detrimental. The student often feels pulled in a bunch of different directions. Uh, there is often bad advice given about different things. So I just feel bad because it doesn't work out well, and I always want things to work out as well as possible. Um, so that, that would be my, my recommendation against it. The other, there's one other reason. People already paid for us. <laughs> so some of these people are very expensive. And you know, they, the only thing that they can do that we can't do, the only things they can do that we can't do, are things that shouldn't be done for a student, right? Like write the essay or drag them across the finish line uh, and get their application in. Those are things that really the student should be in charge of. And if someone is having to do those things, that's not a good sign. So that's my thought. That's our thought. We talked about it. We just wanted to leave that with you. It's your decision. If you are feeling like, well, we, we are thinking about it, maybe there's a very specific reason, I'm happy to have a conversation about it. I, either of us are. We, we won't be offended. We want what's best for you and for, for your students. OK, last couple things, and then we'll take some uh, question and answer with whatever time we have. Um, I think these are, are they up there? No, they're not. I'll just read them back. OK, okay. so a couple things. Uh, please use the resources of our office, right? Give us a call, email. Um, come to our programs. Whatever you need, we're here for you. Uh, we want to serve you. We want to serve your students to the full extent of our ability. And you know, this is this is the main thing that we do. We all we have a couple other things that we do, but this is mostly what we do. We have time to serve you, um, so please take advantage of us. Uh, number two, I would urge you to keep a kind of sense of adventure and fun about the process and uh, help your kids to do the same thing. This should be fun. Right? This is, at least the beginning part is fun. Um, we did kind of read the riot act to the seniors a little bit because they're in that time that's not as fun. Uh, but most of the part of the process is fun. Um, and it's exciting for students to have the opportunity to direct their lives in ways that they haven't before. So that's pretty cool. Um, we like to remind them of this quote from Abraham Lincoln, uh, a person is about as happy as he makes up his mind to be. And you know, there's limits. but Mostly that's true, and so let's, I think, all decide that this is going to be fun. Okay. Uh, number three, do make sure that your child takes the lead in this process. And I know, you know, some of you are thinking like, I don't see that working out that way. <laughs> it's going to work out. They can do it. Um, from my experience, and we'll see what these numbers are at Fountain Valley, but, you know, like, I'd say maybe 65% of students, like, they pretty much get it, you know, with the right amount of instruction and guidance and so on. And then there's maybe 20% where you have to do a little bit of reminding and pushing. Um, and then, I'm doing my math here, and there's maybe 10% where it's like, all right, we, uh, let's get this going. You know, there's a lot that has to go in, but eventually it happens. And then there's maybe 5% where the connection doesn't really fully come together, and you want, that's when you wonder, like, is going to college next year really the right decision? And it's much better and cheaper to have that discussion before they go and you know, fail and cost you money and all that kind of stuff. So it is a little bit of a litmus test. I mean, if you look at the service academies, Naval Academy, Air Force, and so on, I mean, they, they do design it that way on purpose, right? They really want to see, they're putting that person through the test to see do they really want to be here, can they do it? And they, to some extent, that's true with other colleges. But I think it's okay for us to think of it that way this is a little bit of a litmus test. Um, number four, spread the net widely at first. Uh, we might have an individual meeting and we might throw a bunch of schools on the list and be like, oh, what is that? But that's okay. Um, or uh, your child might say, I am going to France for college. And you might be thinking like, you are not. <laughs> Don't tell them that right then. They'll figure it out if that's not supposed to happen. There's plenty of time for those discussions to happen. But spreading the net widely at first is great because 
The worst thing, actually, is to get too focused on one thing early and then come May of senior year and there aren't the right options because things have changed. Okay. Uh, lastly, which is kind of the same thing, is just keep an open and honest dialogue about all of those things. Uh, finances, geographic location, cost, all those things. There's time for it to work out. Um, there's no need for, on either side or any of the sides, for like absolute proclamations early on in the process. It'll all work out. Anything? Okay. So, uh, what are we looking at in time? We're a little bit over. We got about five minutes for any questions. Yes? Um, what, do you guys have a opinion on early decision or, or the rolling emissions you can do early that might um, need more preparation from juniors maybe in the spring or the summer? I don't know. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think... Yeah, I, I think it's important for students and parents to <clears throat> take note of specific specific application deadlines um, and to take those into consideration. Uh, they're layered. Um, application deadlines also um, affect uh, students' finances or merit scholarships or um, just a family's need for a much longer runway in making a decision um, in terms of what a student should be doing during their junior year as it relates to application deadlines, not much. Okay. Um, I think it is completing, finishing the junior year on a very bright, positive note, um, and then for parents, as Jeff sort of concluded, keeping an open mind, casting a wider net, and then when <clears throat> students return in August, that's when the, the two, well, that's when definitely I would begin to look at appropriate application deadlines for that student. Yeah, I mean, it is a super complicated part of the process and very individualized. So, you know, I have general opinions about, say, early decision, but whether it's a good idea for one student or another, that's really individualized. One of the things that I think uh, we can reassure you is that, you know, both Stephen and I know the landscape of how all of those different decision plans are used, or at least we can give you a sense of that, and it is different at every school. And so we can help as we're figuring out a list. It's not just, okay, apply to these 10 places, but when? Mm -hmm. What's the strategy of it? And you wish, I mean, we probably all wish that that wasn't the way it worked. You know, probably the colleges wish that too, is like a logical way to make a decision is you apply to 10 places, you see where you get in, you see where it's gonna cost, you see what you're feeling like in April of senior year, and get all the information you can and then make a decision. That's obviously not the way it works, right? And so we have to account for that. But I think also um, refuse to be a pawn in the game too, and to say, you know what, this might be, might have some admissions advantage, but I'm just not comfortable <laughs> doing that. I'm gonna wait and see what my options are. Right, so it's a, it's a delicate balance with that, but that is certainly part of what we will counsel about. And I think in terms of your specific question about junior year, I would encourage not, think, not going at it like this, I have to find my early decision. That's not the approach, but to do a more holistic review through the process, and if it seems appropriate to apply an early decision based on where a student is and what the family situation is, then you talk about it, mm -hmm. rather than positing early decision. Got it. Yep. Yes? Um, what's nice is that you know, you're working with a smaller group of students, and you'll each have your caseload. Do you work collaboratively? So for one student's safety is somebody else's reach, and you <laughs> talk together, because you don't want six kids from FBS applying to the same school, for example. So how does that work? Yeah, I mean, certainly. We're collaborative. Yes, certainly we are working together. I mean, our office is pretty small. If we weren't going to be collaborative, it would be a problem. Uh, so, but I would say too, like we don't, we don't really want students thinking about, oh, I'm going to not apply there because my this person's applying there, or you know, that can get out of hand very quickly. And honestly, colleges can take as many students as they want from a school, right? Um, they. The students meet the things that they're looking for, then they can take two or three or whatever from even a small school. So 
we haven't noticed a lot of crosstalk about that um, with the senior class, and we want to try to diminish, keep that as low as possible, um, because that is very detrimental to students, I think, mm -hmm. mental health and friendships, and mm -hmm. just the spirit of camaraderie that exists here. So we'll reassure them that where your friend is applying is not going to be, you're not competing against your friend, you're competing against the whole community. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. I understand that there's no formal uh, or mandatory sessions for, for starting the process, right? Is that what you said? Uh, no, that is not true. Yeah. There are required things. <laughs> for different stages. Yeah, let me, okay, let me clarify that. No, there are definitely required things, uh, and we take attendance, right? If there's a class meeting, they need to be there. When we start the small group seminars, they will be scheduled it's like a class. They can't miss it. Right. When it's time to have an individual meeting, everybody will have one at that time. At a certain point, beyond the basics, then it's going to be more optional in the sense of when do students have me read their essay, or uh, when do students come and talk to Stephen about their, call, their visit that they made, because everybody's on a different timeline. But there will, be, there, will be a required, there will be required programming, and there'll be a required adherence to a certain, a certain general sense of what needs to be any kind of uh, uh, aptitude test, you know, that for them to realize what is what are their preferences, because at this stage we're we're junior, right? So it's, it's, I like everything or I hate everything. Right. Yes. Yeah. Familiar with that? Yes. So, uh, um, yeah, that's part. Right. That's part of the uh, small group seminars is that there will be some diagnostic tests, some uh, <coughs> analysis, and not just about college preferences, but about skills and attitudes and, and personal self-knowledge. And that, I mean, we really want to take advantage of this opportunity for students to learn more about themselves. Because if you think about creating fit, it's, a, it's an equation, right, with an equal sign in the middle. On one side is the colleges, and the other side is the students. So if they don't know themselves, they can't draw that, that equal sign to the colleges. Yeah, that might be here. Excuse me, one more here. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious about, in terms of the essay, what sort of process and support do you provide? Uh, I mean, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. Um, so we give equal time. Yeah. We'll go, okay. Equal. Equal. Um, Jeff and I have read thousands of essays. I've also worked in college admissions. Um, you know, my a very broad understanding of the essay is it should complement what the college admission office is reading, right? It should add to and or complement. It should be personal in uh, tone. It should be accessible uh, and well-written, right? It underscores what makes that applicant special, um, and it also should underscore or highlight their uh, skills as a writer, a communicator. Um, in terms of just backing away from that general sentiment or you know the characteristics that make up a good college essay, um, the English department here uh, collaborates, works alongside college counseling. Uh, it's more of a personal narrative unit. Each uh, senior English teacher has their own approach. Um, so the, it, it is comprehensive. But most importantly, I, I would ask, and, and Jeff I'm certainly will add on to this, that eat, your child takes time to find a quiet space and to first think about who they are and what piece of them they want to share with the with a college ad admission office, and to just be patient and to know they're going to work on that essay in small portions. It's not uh, a piece of writing that happens overnight. It has in the past. That's very rare. Um, and in terms of parental involvement, you may see it, you may not. And what what I've always liked to do is to keep a lot of fingerprints off a student's essay because I'm a 50 year old man. I'm reading, I see the world differently, I use language differently than teenagers and colleges can pick up on that. Yeah, I mean I think it's still a little bit of a work in progress. I can tell you what we did this year. I can tell you that we're gonna have a meeting with the English department uh, after November 1st when we put our heads above water and just see like what should we do next year? How are we, how are we gonna work this? But 
Um, definitely, we had this year a essay writing workshop that we put on with our advisees right at the beginning of the year. It was about two hours. The English department followed up with that by assigning essays, by working on them in class, peer editing, all those kinds of things. And then we had students come back to us with the first draft, and then we helped them you know, move it on through the process. I expect it will be something similar to that. I would expect that in the spring, um, we will offer probably something optional for students who really want to do some work on it over the summer to kind of give them that ability to do that, and that we will be happy to you know, read essays over the summer and communicate with them. That's you know, traditionally what we've done. Thank you. Um, we're also working on, uh, each of us has had a, a kind of comprehensive college counseling handbook at our previous schools um, that kind of is everything that we know put into book form. It's usually like a half page. Um, <laughs> and we're working on, you know, kind of compiling one from what was here, what we have brought, and we will, you know, we hope to have that ready by the end of the year, in time, end of this calendar year, um, in time to get that to, in your hands and um, in the teacher's hands when we get started. One last quick question, then we got to pause so we can get our speaker. How has AI affected this process? That is a great question. Let me ask AI for the answer to that. <laughs> um, and that'd be a great question for Chris to answer too, because I think I, I, we actually talked about that being something that people would be. Um, I mean, so far it hasn't been, I, I thought it was going to be a landslide effect. So far, I haven't seen it be a massive effect, and I, you know, I uh, compliment um, the seniors here for not resorting to that, um, and, the, and you know, really doing the hard work of trying to write their essays themselves. I have, just out of curiosity, uh, I've sort of taken my raw materials that I might use for writing a recommendation and put it in there to see what would happen. And it's not terrible, but it's not great either, right? It's certainly not anything I would want to turn in because it, it's boilerplate, it's bland, you know, and obviously it's like anything else, it depends on the input that you put in. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's a situation we're still monitoring and seeing how it develops. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody's figured out exactly is the approach to say, like, this is a tool, how do we best use it? Probably, in some sense. Um, but I think in the end, a personal essay has to be a person. And it's gonna be pretty obvious, at least right now, um, on the college side. But, you know, we'll hear what Chris has to say about that. We have to regroup. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll take a short break to give time for senior parents to come in. I was like, I guess we're over time, but um, we'll get Chris down here started. There is a restroom there. Probably a good idea to lock it. Um, <laughs>